All right. Welcome to this week's Monday meeting. Today is December 16th, 2019. Monday meetings are a chance for motion designers all over the world to connect and ask questions, share inspiration, or hear presentations and interact with industry leading artists on an equal playing field. Your host today is me, Mark Sinozia, and today we have guests Mark and Simon from uh, Panoply. Is that how you say it? I want to make sure. I, okay. I want to make sure <laughs> so I don't fucking butcher it. Um, if you have a question, please use the raise your hand function located under participants. Uh, if you want to be called on and ask a question, if you're unable to, uh, ask your question via that, you can type question in the chat so we can field them properly. This is essentially raising your hand and any comments or questions that seem to go off topic too much or, uh, seem to be kind of spammy will mute, uh, will be muted. And as usual, this call will be recorded. So if you have any concerns about something that was said on the call, uh, maybe it's under NDA or you don't feel comfortable with it going live into the public, uh, let us know and we can omit that um, in the final release. We'll edit that out. Um, so without further ado, we'll kind of just jump right into it. We're very excited to have Mark and Simon joining us today. And um, yeah, so thanks for coming on. And I know there's a lot of people joining today that probably have some good questions and are very big fans of your work. So um, would love to kind of hear just a background on both of you guys and how the studio started and then we'll kind of kick it off from there. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Uh, um, should I ask? Yeah. Yeah, you go ahead. I'll, uh, I'll basically. <laughs> yeah, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll basically start because uh, Panoply sort of started its sort of early days. It was about five years ago now, and it was around the time when actually I was working as a freelancer at different studios around London. And actually, at the time, I think I was at Manvers Machine working with Simon and a lot of and quite a few others who uh, we've worked with since then, and. I think I'd been freelancing for at that point for about five to six years, I think. And it was a case of I needed a new challenge. And I knew that one day that I would want to at least tackle setting up a studio. Uh, but when that time, I wasn't quite sure when. But you hit a barrier when you're freelancing at times. Well, I did myself anyway, when I was kind of like, more work was coming in that I was able to sort of do. And also there was the scale of jobs that were coming towards me at the time were not necessarily doable for one person. You could, but you'd basically just burn out probably within a month. Um, so it was a case of I was looking for a partner around the time to set up a business. And that person I got chatting to was uh, another freelancer called Reno Futterer. And he was a guy that we set up uh, Panoply five years ago. And our aim was essentially to set up a, to be a creative studio rather than a sort of a motion production sort of house where we would essentially take ownership of our design and direction, but also be able to execute on our high end production levels as well. So it's almost like, I don't know, I'm not sure what label you want to put on it these days. Like there's so many thrown around, uh, but that's the, the premise for what we sort of wanted to set out to create. And it was more about sort of making sure we drew, drew a line in the sand between us as individuals and Panoply as a company. Because if we wanted to operate as a studio, we couldn't essentially carry with ourselves our, our reputations as freelancers directly into the studio. Well, from our perspective, that's what we wanted to do, I should say. And we wanted to create this whole individual identity for this company that would essentially become Panoply. So we built up a decent amount of reserves of our own sort of income to essentially see us through. We then set about creating a couple of launch projects that set basically set us on our route, um, sort of going to where we wanted to be. Um, we sort of had two projects that sort of kicked off our um, sort of run when we started. And one was Genesis. And I'd say that was probably more tailored towards uh, the individual as it with our peers almost because it was sort of generated more buzz or maybe around sort of the how things were done and like it was at the time it was using Houdini that was a lot more sort of less sort of used I would say now and it was a case of it, it proposed more questions about who we were and where we were going 
And then the other project we had was very much created towards the client facing sort of thing. So it wanted this is was a guide to happy and it wanted to be a project where we could essentially assert ourselves where people would ask less about what render engine you did, how did you animate it, like can we see behind the scenes than what the actual message was and what was the creative vision behind what was being showcased and how it came across rather than all of the other stuff. Um, so that sort of kicked us off and thankfully our investment paid off, otherwise we would have been very, very poor very, very quickly. Um, so it sort of, we hit the ground running thankfully and since then we've sort of scaled quite slowly I should say. We've sort of scaled up our studio space as we've gone and now we're in enough space that we can grow into a team of about eight people now. Um, I, we're being very selective about how we sort of grow. Uh, it's a case of we've brought in certain people at certain times that haven't quite necessarily fit uh, within how we like to operate as a team. Like not necessarily, they've op we've always worked with fantastic people with great attitudes and literally work commitments. That's not been the case. It's because of the way we've sort of set out to sort of operate and the type of projects that we try to go in for, we need to uh, like, it's like the highest level and sort of most skilled we need as well, but also they need to have like a very strong design and background as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that, those are the people that we're looking to grow into. Um, so after about three years, um, Renault was sort of very much sort of getting in more into his sort of branding and graphic design and um, sort of basically a lot more to do with uh, the traditional arts, I would say almost more typography. And he was almost falling out, I think, a little bit out of love with motion, almost a little bit of uh, sort of burnout, I suppose, from it. Um, well, from my perspective, that's how I saw it. And he needed to sort of scratch that itch. So sadly, after three years, he wanted to sort of go his own way and sort of sort of choose to go down that route and sort of go down that path. And then I was sort of left a, an opportunity to kind of go, okay, well, I can push on with Panoply as it is. Um, everything was, we've done the first three years, which is, I would say, not the easiest part for any sort of company. Uh, but I was like, okay, well, part of the battle of this is having a partner to battle through this with. And that's where uh, I think literally the day that, uh, Reno basically said he wanted to sort of part ways. I think I messaged you straight away yeah. to sort of have lunch. And so then it was a case of I sort of started chatting to Simon. So I'll let yeah, you take over. I mean, I was yeah. I, I had been at MAMD for uh, Members Machine for eight nine years at that point, and I was had uh, handling my notice and was just about to actually set something up uh, on my own. So it was kind of like the perfect oh. time. So it was kind of weird. And a little bit stressful because I had to make up my mind really quickly and straight after being full time for so long. Like, but uh, it was kind of a good timing, which is why I did it partly, mm -hmm. but also because we worked together and I knew kind of what to expect. Um, and you know, so so that 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 was it basically. Like January, whenever February, I don't know. Oh, yes. Whenever it's it was. Two years ago, isn't it? I think. Time flies. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I joined directly after like the Christmas break, basically, more or less. Uh, and yeah, it's been a <laughs> grind since. <laughs> yeah. Now, did you guys meet at Man V? Is that how you guys yeah. got to know each other? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. I think it was a case of, I think, I, I remember my first week or two there, I think I sort of came in, I think, as another one of the guys who just, just started there full time, sort of said, oh yeah, like I was available to sort of come in and freelance for a bit. And I think like Simon and I are very much in the same way for, with how we like to sort of work on certain uh, projects and how we sort of tackle the particular challenges. So I think from the first instance that uh, uh, I think Simon sort of poking us sort of like bouncing ideas off us right from the beginning. So yeah. it's kind of like we got along really well, like right from the instance. And I think from when I started at, at Manvi as a freelancer, I basically permalanced there for what, nine, 10 months? Don't and that. like, it was a case of like, they were so, so busy at the time that literally they, they like, it was a great place to be. And like the, the, like some of the people that have been there have like everyone's moved on or still there. And yeah, the people that have gone on for there are doing some ridiculously cool things now. It's, it's just so cool mm. to see. Awesome. Now I would love to hear a little bit more of like, um, you know, some of the stuff you alluded to earlier in terms of like being 
fairly picky with the projects that you guys do. Um, and I would love to kind of hear some more information about, you know, how you choose those projects. And then, um, you know, are you guys involved with, you know, the creative direction? Are you, you know, given a brief or are you pitching onto these spots? Um, I guess a little bit more, you know, maybe some background on how you get those projects off the ground and select the ones that you want to do. Of course, yeah. Um, I think the, the simplest way to sort of explain it is that it's, it's just an uphill slope. It, it always is. Like, um, unless you're an agency, I feel, that's been around for five to ten years and you've built that reputation and you have that muscle and also you have most of the account handlers to sort of hold clients' hands for some of the bigger clients, um, it can be quite tough. Um, but what, how we've sort of positioned ourselves is to like, the whole thing about Panoply is it's a collection thing. So it's, uh, the whole word collaboration is thrown around a lot, but it allows us to play off our, uh, essentially what our company is all about. So if a client comes to us, particularly an agency, uh, we'll try and sort of like, turn it to a point where the, the, our value doesn't just come from literally the way we can execute things. It's like mm -hmm. everyone, like everyone here, I'm sure as well, like is more than just a button pusher. It's like, we're not just here to just say, okay, like you want, here's a storyboard, here's a script, just do it exactly as we say. And this is what we're saying. Like the benefit comes from literally working with people who bring something to the table. But the point is, if the client or the agency doesn't know that you have that at your disposal, they're not going to trust you with it. So it's trying to build those relationships with uh, clients, essentially. But then sometimes we've had a little bit of luck, I should say, in the last year, surprisingly so to us as well, with working with ad agencies. And it's been a case of we've, they've come to us as the earliest possible uh, stage, which we've then taken advantage of. So we've got a project, which I can't actually say who it's for, but it's launching in early next year. And there's been a case of, it's been, been doing it over the course of this year and it's been slightly delayed due to products and samples and stuff not going right on the, front, the client end. But they came to us generally just with a vague idea of what they wanted to do. And it, we started the discussions and literally pitched the whole creative as a, a collaboration between the two of us. And it allowed us to essentially do the, the, very, the creative was still very much, I would say, coming from the agency, but we were allowed to influence it, I would say. Like, and that was essentially that allowed us to drive our direction. And I think when it comes out, I think it's probably one of the strongest pieces we've done as a studio, probably in the last couple of years. Um, and it's like, it's a nice, really nice piece. Like it's, it, it has all the technical flourish that loads of people will enjoy, but as a piece, it holds together really well. And for a client piece, it's very uh, advertising friendly, um, which trying to pair those two at times can be hard because they can always lean towards the more artistic side and people kind of go, oh, that's cool, but what is it? Um, so it's, it's one of those things that we, we can do these technical things and we can execute these abstract worlds, but we don't just do them without any sort of, like we don't just randomly come up. There's a basis behind why we do things. And there's always an audience in mind that we're thinking of. Um, so it's 100%, as soon as a client gets in touch with us, we will actually try and outlay and say, look, yes, we can do this the way you'd like to do it. We can do this, that, and the other. But have you thought about doing it this way? We can have a discussion about this, like offering up that value and also pushing that point that that is where our value is, not just in the tail end of a project or the second half, depending on how mm -hmm. you want to sort of see it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. that's a long way of saying it but it's, yeah uh, it is <laughs> yeah um so in terms of like your workflow and stuff i mean i'm curious to know do you build in a lot of time for like r d and stuff or are you you know do you flush a lot of those ideas out in those kind of beginning stages with the agency or client or whoever it is um and then, you know, kind of hit the ground running with some storyboards and style frames and, and off you go. Or, or are you kind of doing R&D while brainstorming with the agency and all that and trying to just come up with different concepts that way? So as a general rule of thumb, it kind of, it, it, it's hard to 
generalize because each project has different sure. dif different things that it is required from it. But I would say um, we like to think of the R and D process as just the design process, and and you know it's it's uh, depending on the job. Sometimes we just it's just required. I mean, we did one job that we also can't talk about <laughs> because it's also under NDA, but that was like literally just R and D the entire project. Uh, it was like it's um, we can't talk about it. <laughs> maybe in about two years' time. Yeah, maybe in two it, years' it's time. A sort of, in this sort of project, in two years' time, we'll be able to probably say what it's for. And uh, probably also at that point, we probably yeah. won't like it anymore. But <laughs> yeah. that's, the, that's another that's another thing. But um, yeah, it's very hard to to give a straight answer to that, I would say. Um, I think like, it, it's kind of like, you're right, it's, we, our R&D phase, we, when, however we tailor it for a client, it's, it's always um, tailored as the creative R&D phase, uh, tr essentially that, to allow us to do that design end of things as well, but also play with ideas about how to get a message across. Um, so 100%, we always have that time allotted, whether it's, yeah. A week, two weeks. Ideally, the long we that the, this is where when we get in as early as possible, we will take literally say, look, the value of your project will get better if we have more time to experiment. And we we like literally, we might do a week of things that don't necessarily hit the point, but it will lead us on that path for that on that last day. Something comes out of nowhere, and you're like, okay, look, this is the whole thing, and this is going to set us on the path for the next two months to where the project's going to finish. And in some cases, like uh, for example, on the game awards, like we 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 knew we didn't have that much time, so we tailored the the uh, the actual our our workflow in a way that it was quite modular, so we could like uh, slot in and out different parts, and we built like essentially an infrastructure for the project that would allow us to stay flexible uh, depending on how much or little time we would find to kind of develop different ideas we could they could then slot in without actually destroying the piece you know it's not reliant on this piece falling into place because you can kind of find alternative routes around it because we have that infrastructure in place i know we can we, i know we're probably going to talk about that later but it that's what i mean it's very different per, per project uh, sure. so and, you know, while we touched on it, why, let's just jump into a little bit of that, too. You had mentioned um, that the, the timeline for the Game Awards spot was pretty tight. And obviously you had to keep things, you know, modular so you could, you know, uh, be flexible with that. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe using that project as our, you know, example for now, if you want to walk us through the process that you guys took for that, being sure. in such a tight timeline, I think, you know, that's probably something a lot of us resonate with is that a lot of projects come in and it's like, hey, we need this in two weeks or whatever. And you're like, ah, and you want to spend that time, you know, you want to have as much time as possible to, you know, really flush out the design and, and spend time doing R&D and all that. But sometimes those projects don't allow for that. So I'd be curious to hear your workflow with the game awards spot, but then, you know, how do you balance, you know, all the moving parts with something like that? Yeah. So on game awards, all they come to us and they only had, it was like the brief was essentially, they wanted to show that games come alive. That was their kind of mantra with behind that. And um, so we, we just had a little think about how we could structure the project and what, would make sense. Uh, we had just over four weeks to do the project. Uh, I'd like to say five, but I'm not entirely sure. And uh, if you've seen the piece, you know, it's quite a lot of technical stuff going on in there and it's quite expressive in a lot of ways. Um, but we came, we, we settled with a concept um, that basically we kind of thought of it uh, because it's a way of celebrating the different um, different parts of game creation, uh, you know, the entire watch they, they have like best um, soundtracks and best gameplay and what, all of these different aspects. We were thinking, what if we have a scene that is uh, basically our base scene? We, we started with just one camera and one like uh, setting. And then we, we decided, what if, what if we can kind of 
tune the channel, basically like an FM radio, where you just like change the channel and you get different perspectives of the same scene, essentially. You pick up signals from all these different perspectives. So it would be maybe the modeler shows off their, their thought process and how they build up the different assets. Maybe the coder has like some sort of connections or they're making maybe the simulations involved. We show the underlying invisible forces and whatnot. So it would kind of like the statue itself would act as a sort of uh, signal jammer that would then distort your image and that would take us through these different abstractions. So that was the kind of concept and that way we could kind of quite easily, we, we, we set up some ground rules. We knew that we had these shots that was set in a base scene. We used a lot of mega scan assets and stuff for that to, to get some kind of decent production value out the front and then also we knew that now we need to design with this in mind that we need to be able to build an abstraction around the scene. So we could then start going into R and D and like build up various uh, expressions based on these scenes. So it was very modular because if one ab abstraction didn't work, you could either take it out and just have the base in there, or you could replace it with another one. And mm -hmm. we used to jump back and forth. Yeah, and then we knew then. Uh, we, you know, we knew the structure of the project. We also had like a couple of other types of shots. So we had like, for each abstraction, we had a very, we knew we were going to have a lot of uh, cuts and stuff. So we wanted to have a centralized, somewhat symmetrical shot uh, of each abstraction, more or less. Uh, because, because you're cutting fast, you want the eye to recognize the forms quickly and, and understand the structure behind it. And it's also a way of isolating it and making it very graphic, uh, in a quick manner. So we, we had three different types of shots and we knew the, the, the outline of what we needed to create very early on. And that was the first part. And then we could kind of start to, I don't know how long we had on each abstraction, but it was only a couple of days, you know, to figure out the designs for them. I think, yeah, it was the main thing was basically, uh, it was making anything we created could be adaptable to whichever scene we wanted to drop it into. Because uh, as much as we got very, we had like weekly check-ins uh, with the client as well. So it was a point that we had a lot of trust from them. And there was essentially, thankfully, there wasn't too much pushback. There was questions about, oh, can we do this? Can we do that? Mm -hmm. um, but it allowed us to basically sculpt our vision rather than trying to have to solve the client's problems along the way as well. Mm -hmm. um, that, like The only reason we were able to do it in such a time span was because of that. Like. If you were having drastic um, sort of feedback from a client, uh, I don't think we'd have survived it um, because it was the ambition for what the client wanted to do. And also I'd say what we set out to do as well, I should say, because the sheer great, the great freedom that we had with this project was one where you, we took the chance and we like pushed it a lot further than we otherwise usually would because it allows us to sort of, it, it comes back to what I was saying before, essentially, if we want to showcase our value as of, from this great event of things, these are the projects where you need to show it. Um, and that's what we really made sure we put across. Yeah. And it was also a very difficult project in some ways because we were tr trying to, we had this idea of this signal that was tuning in. So we were like, okay, this is sort of 2D layer now that we need to kind of take into consideration. Do we want to show multiple layers at the same time? Do we show like four different expressions as one? Well? Now you have this 2D mix with like all the, you know, complexities that that brings to the table. So it was kind of like <laughs> a big undertaking, but it was, it was an interesting challenge. And I mean, well, we sculpted the structure first. We sculpted the structure say, first and we, that. it's always about having some, something to fall back on as well. So you have a way out. <laughs> So mm -hmm. just not delivering is not an option. Obviously. So was it just an open brief for you guys with essentially just uh, the games come alive or games come alive and then you guys kind of flesh that out? It was that plus like a slight color scheme. Basically, I had a, wanted okay. to have like blue and red. <laughs> that's it. it. Yeah. <laughs> so they, yeah, that's it, basically. Um, a question that just came into the chat from Jesus. I don't know if you have a mic, if you want to hop in and ask this question, um, but feel free to. Are you there? Sure. I have yeah. a mic. Sweet. Awesome. Hey guys, big hey. fan here. So it's really nice to meet you and, you know, be on the call. Thank you for doing that. So you, you were saying that you had four weeks to, uh, to 
do this project and I'm curious to hear about like storyboards and how you pitch the client, you know, the whole sequence before diving into animation because there's a lot of abstract thinking in this and, you know, four weeks is, it's not a lot for, I, I guess, for something like this. So curious to see how that went. If, do you guys just dive into animation and started playing around or do you guys actually come up with a storyboard? Uh, we did. Like we wrote a creative treatment, didn't we? Yeah, I don't remember if we drew some sketch something out, but we do have some. I mean, if you want to show that, um, which I can briefly one sec. I might be able to. Well, oh, is there a way to screen share on here? Like, yeah, there should be a little share. green button on the bottom that says share. Okay, Got it. one sec. Uh, let me open up something first. Okay, so uh, while you do that, I'll I'll try to explain. But basically, the first thing we started doing was doing a proof of concept even before we fully committed to this treatment. And that was just making one scene with one camera. It was kind of like cutting in and out of different, uh, different, uh, different parts, like different abstractions. If you could pull that up in a bit, that would be cool. Yeah, yeah that's the first thing. So you'll see that in a bit. But um, after we had that, we basically, we knew we wanted to have this base in, as I said. So we, we, we built up this space and we just created camera moves that that felt nice. We started with stills, we then animated each one, and we put them in in a uh, with a vague idea in mind of how we wanted it to come together and what which ones would be replaced with abstractions later on. Once we had this, and this we did in like two three days, no, more than that, three four days I would say, um, and we sent that across on I think the second second meetup we had or second meeting we had with the client. So I think though this is like the first. This the is very like, first this is one we sent the test. This is well, the first test before we say so we sent. Did I see the screen? Most they can see. I think. Oh. Can you see this one? Okay, one. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this is kind of what how is this everything was sold on. I won't go really through it in detail, but the point is, it was just literally a document where we could showcase uh, a, a concept, basically what it is, why it is, and how it's going to go about. So literally everything's done in written word. And then a case of it is a narrative that is essentially outlining what the, the world that we're going to create and the path we're going to take to get to, to from a, basically from A to B. It's very much done in a descriptive level. And then everything else is essentially mood references for the different things that are explained within the concept or the narrative. So these parts are very much often taken from, there's a couple of motion references in here, but a lot of we, our references come from photography and Often when we're doing stuff like got Dota glitch stuff here, uh, mathematical patterns, because essentially that was a request basis. actually from them as well. They wanted yes, some yeah. sort of show the mathematics oh. of, of the system. So that was actually in the brief. We realize obviously some people are listening in on this, so we won't go into too deep, but the, from an outset, it's basically mood references to essentially outline of creative vision. And then on top of that, we, sent a motion test, which is essentially was a small, I don't know if it'll play back as well. Oh, okay. So it's sort of like a small segment that basically just showed the glitch type effect for how we go from one world to another and how stuff was overlaid when we were bringing in additional 2D elements as almost windows into this addition, into this like underlying world. Uh, so it was just that motion test with that creative document that essentially set us on a path and the client was like, great, I can understand where you guys are going. And allowed us to hit the ground running rather than kind of go, okay, we need to do a storyboard for exactly each one. Yeah. Uh, and Hazel, so you have to answer your question. We didn't do a storyboard, but what we did do was the first stage essentially was we blocked out a load of scenes and then essentially we built an animatic of, from those that kind of sculpted our story very early on. And then essentially that is essentially what we sent to our audio uh, guys as well. So that then the first time that they see the animatic it is tailored with the um, audio as well. So everything oh. kind of feels like a, a major selling, like the earliest point we can get our audio guys involved, we always do, purely because it seeing something with audio from an early stage helps sell things in and it helps get the trust, we find, purely because one, it'll either go one way or get their trust, or one, it will basically alert you to any point that uh, any clients that are going to cause you problems. Because if they start picking on small things to do with soundtracks and things at this point, it means you need to then probably hold their hand 
a lot more throughout the process. And then you have to simplify the concept. Exactly. Yeah. So luckily for this case, we did not have to do that. Like we, the client absolutely loved the track that we first yeah, took through. So it was a home But run. Uh, there was, uh, I mean, in other projects we've had, we do have storyboard. We usually do a sketched out storyboard in some cases where it makes sense without explaining. It's time them. permitting though, isn't it really? Yeah, at least it, it's all about getting an agreement and understanding early on so if it's not if you get these warning signals from the client that they you might feel that they they will be complicated to work with then it's trying to build the, it's, try, it's know. trying to build that trust but hang on to it um i think there's a saying or something along the lines of like it, that all the, the the longer the project goes on the more you're going to have to give whether that means that the client's going to ask for more or they're going to get really sort of their boss above them is going to get more answers, so they're going to give you more shitty feedback. So that you have to maintain that level of expert for as long as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. And if you give it early on, it's not going to bode well for the rest of the project. Like it's just going to cause your head. I think this is the most stressful part of the project: is <laughs> establishing this the baseline and, and finding the the infrastructure. Because when once we have that, then we knew. Now we just need to populate the edit. We need to populate these sections. And yeah. we know what we we know what's gonna work. We, we we can kind of we have enough design sensibility to kind of understand when it's not gonna work, and we can just keep iterating on it. Hmm. But then then the structure is there. So, yeah. Do you guys put any parameters in place with uh, with a client on a tight turnaround project like this to keep the ball rolling? Say if the client did come back with all this feedback, like you put you know certain parameters in place where it says like if you have this feedback we need it within x amount of time we got to keep this thing moving That's otherwise true. it's going to go off the rails yeah i mean you have to do that also like any yeah exactly but that's why you invest as little a little effort as possible early on but you kind of try to get that gauge quickly mm -hmm. and see where where it's going and and it, it is a gamble. It's always going to be a little bit of a gamble, but yeah, you need to. I think uh, it's a case of like, it's, in, I think like say for the instance on this, if we always use this one as an example, like with five weeks to turn it around, it's a case of we were like, look, the most you're going to get is one is weekly check-ins. Like you can't be sort of like having in-betweens here unless we decide that we need to sort of have a check-in. And this is outlined right at the beginning. So it's just a small line in the contract and say, look, these are the dates you're committing to. Anything outside these parameters will have to be factored in. So they know that they have the right to get, to become a pain in the ass if they really want to. Like we're not stopping them from, they just need to understand that that requires more time, that costs more money, uh, more costs for us. So it's just basically being as truthful and honest right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, did, did the Game Awards seek you guys out and approach you to do this? Yes, yeah, I think we've, I think we've been Jeff, talking to them for, for a few years, yeah. but we've turned them down because we haven't had time. When, so when, I, would, when, I would assume that would like help establish a little bit of trust right off the bat too, that they're coming to you from, you know, previous work or whatnot, um, yeah. which, yeah. you know, is always a, a nice thing to have kind of in the back pocket is, you know, if they're coming to you, uh, that they're already somewhat trusting your vision and, and like your style and execution on things. So yeah, that's a yeah. nice thing to have. You have to kind of do an educated guess where, where you want to steer in the project. But yeah, in this case, we, we went for it. We like tried to push the complexity and, and, and also push ourselves a little bit into other realms that where we weren't. <laughs> too comfortable, which was kind of some of the 2D elements that we haven't been doing that much. In the end, we ended up not doing as much of that as we, but we developed. More we we developed things. a lot that didn't end up in the film, unfortunately. Uh, mm -hmm. But had we had even more time, we would have perfected it. Or if it felt, it felt uh, sometimes less is more, so <laughs> let's just say that. Mm -hmm. um, and when the time wasn't, if we had, had double the time, it would have been great. I think you felt like this. We showcased like the one, the version before we launched, as in the one the week before. Um, there was too much in it, I would say. Like we actually scaled a lot of elements back to give a more appreciation for what was already there, because when you're trying to sort of create this sort of tuning signaling effect between these worlds, you 
you can get carried away quite easily and you're kind of like okay the, there's so much nice details and there's nice effects in how this is move, moving between these scenes that you kind of you, it gets lost in what you're actually trying to show so mm -hmm. like when we we sort of leave it one night and come back the next morning and kind of go what the hell I, I can't even decipher what i was trying to sort of showcase here not only that we are very familiar with what we were creating but yeah. if someone with fresh eyes sees it it's going to take them the time to process what they're seeing and if you also have all this added layer of complexity on top sure. you know it's nice to be legible and it was quite a lot of short shots in this one exactly too, yeah due to the soundtrack and how it was edited but yeah. uh it seems like uh jesus has a follow-up question to his his previous one there okay yeah, I wanted to touch base on something that you guys just mentioned because it's something that I struggle with as a, as a freelancer. And it is that I tend to um, stress myself out with like sending clients like daily updates of or progress of what I'm doing. And you were talking about uh, sending weekly uh, progress. So just wanted to see, you know, how, how does that how does that work? Because maybe I'm doing it wrong and I should not be sending stuff daily because, you know, Sometimes in a day you can create a really kick-ass style frame if you versus like taking a couple or three days, you know. Yeah, I'm um, I think it depends. I suppose like if you're working as a freelancer and you're sort of trying to sort of send sort of if there, if if you've got an agreement to send daily updates regardless of whether it is like you'd hope that the studio if you're working with a studio or if you're working with a client has an understanding of what is possible within a day. Um, the point is, if we were to have daily updates, like in what we were doing in this project, we could have done it, but it would have probably broken the confidence of the client in the sense of they were just like, okay, well, I, I can't make any sense of this. Where are you guys going with this? Um, when you're just doing a frame, that's a little bit different because essentially, if you can, if you've got an agreement to kick out that once a day, or you're fine tuning something, then yes, I would say it's quite hard to get around that and get out of that or have any other agreement unless you're saying, look, I'm going to deliver you a design package in a week's time. And then you have an agreement along that way. So rather than sort of selling it to the client saying, look, let's have check-ins every day so you can fiddle with what I'm doing. Let's have, week, let, let's have a week where we sit down and sort of a lot of time and say, look, let's have an hour chat about this. And then we'll discuss what we've done as a whole. You might want to do, right, maybe to build that trust, maybe do it after the first three days or even after two days and then maybe gradually build out your time and the confidence of the client should come because if they kind of go, well, look, we've given him two days and he's come back with what we want. If we're given him three days, he keeps coming back. Like you can build your trust out that way. Like if you, if you lose that trust, you've got to be under the standing that the client is then going to go, well, one sec, do you mind if we see what you've done tomorrow? Like it's going to, it's got to work both ways. Like I can totally understand your wariness with about showing a client something too early or essentially on a daily basis. I mean, but, it wouldn't yeah. even have worked in, for us in no. this project. Cause like, as you, as you know, this is quite a lot of procedural setups and it might take two days before you have anything to look at at all. Cause you might be right. building the infrastructure that is then going to be dressed up and made look pretty. But if you show it before that, that's, that's suicide. <laughs> Cause there's nothing there. It's just like, Oh, here's just a bunch of points. Or whatever, you know, it doesn't. Uh, so uh, I agree with what Mark said, basically. That's what I'm saying. So I guess shifting gears just a little bit from, say, client relations or whatnot, let's maybe nerd out a little bit on some tech things. And um, it looks like uh, Kike had a question, um, more of a hardware question for you guys of, why Linux and how is the path of setting up your infrastructure to mainly Linux machines? Uh, was it a smooth, was it smooth or was, That's did you have a fun. bunch of like troubleshooting <laughs> you had to do? So I did it initially and I can tell you why I did it. And then I carried it over here, <laughs> which yeah. is uh, So I did it because I was working on a project and the Windows update broke my machine like three times in a week and I had to reinstall it. This was a few years ago uh, and there was just no way. And I knew that uh, Houdini was running on Linux. So I just installed it uh, on, I just Google like, which one is the easy one? And it was like Ubuntu, install that, ran and finished the project there. And I was like, wow, this is actually kind of nice. It kind of doesn't bother me. It gets out of my way. And so once I, when I left Manvi afterwards, I, I kind of 
took this with me and started kept working with it and uh, they had the added benefit that I could mount network drives and stuff in the same way that my old Macs and stuff did so the paths would be the same if I opened up a, a file in, in, in new confusion or whatever it would uh, all the files would be linked correctly so that's what the main thing and then also I did some speed tests at the time which I don't know if this holds true to this day, but Redshift was significantly faster on Linux versus Windows. So uh, that's why I did it. And then when I, when I joined Panoply, I proposed it. Mark wasn't against it and we tried it and uh, it's been working quite, quite well, I would say. Now the whole studio is on it. Now yeah. all, all of it, our machines are running Linux and it's nice. It's good. I don't know. Yeah. It's it gets out of your way. It doesn't have all these little pop-ups and malware and all this <laughs> shit. So does Force it come in? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's pretty what good. I mean for hardware. Second side. Sorry, what was that not? Oh, what do you guys run for hardware? What are we've your got, we've got a mixture of machines? Like I think our slowest machine is probably like I think it's like an i9 with still with like three GPUs in it. It's an i7. Uh, I said, and then I think it goes up to probably the machine we got earlier this year, which was the last 32 core thread ripper. And then I think where well, that's got four to 28 ETIs in it, but we've got six, six machines, each with three cards or four cards in yes, and a Mac pro here, a stray sort of sitting there. It's basically just for media encoder. Uh, and that's about it. Um, so yeah, like uh, we have a substantial render farm here, and it's like it's it keeps us warm through the winter. Basically, uh, <laughs> we do not need heating. Uh, uh, but it's it's like, a, it's a mixed bag yeah. of GPUs. We have a lot of old 1080, no, yeah, 1080s, 1080Ti's, and Titan X's from Maxwell, and the older version. Mm -hmm. They are working fine, and then the 2080Ti's in that one machine, but. So Fine. yeah, everything's connected up through deadline. So yes. I like yeah, all everything. Uh, we over the last couple, I say like last month, we've been sort of centralizing our um, sort of software. So to the point that once we, if you have to reinstall a machine, all of your licenses and your plugins and stuff run off the central server. So it just means that like we the like did it literally just last week we upgraded our. Uh, uh, Linux licenses to something else and it could means we can basically format a machine and get all the software that we need on it um, within about two hours um, so for each machine that's quite a big bonus and when you don't have to faff around thinking oh have I installed this have I done this or so when it comes to like running a deadline license when you're like certain machines might have licenses and don't or they don't have a certain plugin and you're getting frames it it just simplifies yeah, it so much all the render all the render installers and everything are also on the server, so they show pointed through it through the environment and plugins for Nuke and everything. It's just all there, so we know that if we upgrade the version of Redshift or whatever we're doing, it, then it, it will go everything, yeah. to everything at the same time because it's all referencing the same installation. What uh, what version are you running for Redshift right now? Because I know there's like the the stable two six builds and now. The more like experimental three builds. Now they're incorporating like the Cinema 4D noises and stuff like that. Um, we are we're on two six still. We used to yeah. production builds. Yeah, we've not we've not even tried version three just yet. Uh, not just, not because we don't want to. Um, it's more just been a case of uh, we've been sticking to like the seven says the production builds only. And last mm -hmm. we've literally just finished a project that was working on it it's not been an opportunity to switch over and still now like the third version three is still sitting in that experimental phase. So, right. um, we're, it, it's kind of strange for us because essentially we use Redshift from the very early days and we were kind of almost used to their rapid sort of development. We realize obviously now they're doing some much greater, bigger things that obviously mm -hmm. take a lot more planning, but it's just been a case of a little bit more patience is required now, uh, which is, that's not a problem because when they do release a production ready and it does hit production, like we have been very confident and very happy with how they've done things. Uh, and that's why we've used it for like the last two, three years. And uh, I see a question here about Creative Cloud. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew that would happen. So, yeah, now we, we, uh, we do have uh, one, 
It's really cloud. Like we, we run it on, we, we do will boot the machines when we need to, but generally we only use uh, Nuke for everything we need. So Nuke, Houdini, yeah, look, Redshift and Deadline, that's all we We've have. We've scaled back. Like we used to use a lot more, as initially, initially when Panoply started, it was using, we used a lot of Cinema and, we used a lot of Cinema and Houdini at that time. Uh, like Genesis as a project was done completely in uh, Houdini at the time. Um, and um, Guide to Happy was done, majoritively all the sort of keyframe animation was done in cinema and then a lot of the effects stuff was uh, brought in via Alembic files from Houdini. Um, but these days basically because we've got to grips with uh, working in Houdini now that it doesn't start like doing keyframe aspects, it, it's, just, it's just normal for us now, like it doesn't feel like we need to go back and forth and we haven't had to for a long time now. Um, and the benefit of that is it's minimized the amount of software that we need to have. So when you reduce the amount of software and the amount of plugins and the amount of things that you have on your machine, one, they run quicker and two, it costs you less as well. Um, and, <laughs> I know you could argue studio. If, yeah, well, so Nuke, I saw Nuke Studio is a bit of a monster. Someone asked about the editing. So yeah, we use Nuke Studio for our timeline, so edit, so you can bring in your EXR uh, sequence from your render and then you can create your comp new comps directly on the timeline and you can keep track of versions and go up and down versions. Simplest way of explaining it is kind of it's like, kind of like after if effects. you took After Effects and you made it so you could scrub in it like Premiere. So essentially you drop in your file sequences, your IOVs and how you did, and you create a pre-comp. And then in that pre-comp, you could run all your node networks the same way you do with any other Nuke sort of composited file. Mm. But then what would happen is then you can up, then look at your timeline and essentially you can just literally scrub through it once it's obviously rendered its section. So you render each pre, each pre comp as it is, and then it becomes scrubbable, uh, and then it can play back as a real-time editor. And it also keeps track of versions. So in some cases, we've had multiple shot, multiple versions of a shot that the client have kept alive, if you know what I mean, where they had some concerns about certain aspects, and then you can just hold down V and you select whichever version you want to render, and there it is. So it keeps track of that and makes it kind of transparent or seamless for us. Do you guys do a lot of the, you know, it seems like you do a lot of compositing. There seems to be like kind of this uh, discussion happening within, you know, the 3D motion world of trying to do it all out of render, composite it with passes, you know, it seems like you guys do, you know, the workflow of you know, multi-passes to really composite the best looking frame. I'd just be curious to hear like your thoughts on that. You know, some people like to try to get it right out of the render itself. Yeah, I think- from that life. Yeah, I, I used to do that a lot. I used to basically try to get it out of from render as much as possible and I used to do almost no comp, but uh, I started using Nuke uh, a few years back and it's just really hard to go back to that mindset now for me because it's not that I'm not trying to make it I mean I, it's, in many cases it might look very very similar to the render that comes directly out of the render but it's the fact that you have each light uh, with it with its reflection specular GI sub all of these different components and the fact that you can tweak them further and make it look even better and have the flexibility if you want to if you're not sure about a light just put it in there and you can then you know, take it out or dial it back or whatever you want to do or grade it separately. It's just the flexibility thing. And in Game Awards, which is, for example, we did a lot of light passes that were, um, that were completely independent. So we, we might render a scene which has like four or five different light setups and we could change them in the timeline of the studio and just screen the different light passes on top of each other. Mm. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm a strong believer in render passes. And I think if you have done it and you have used Nuke, there's like, there's no going back. It's, I mean, even I mean, it, even if you, some cases, you just put in a little color correct, a little tone mapper and some bloom or whatever. You, you start do. approaching things differently, don't you? You kind of like when you, I think when you start trying to create a frame from with it just within uh, say like the render engine like you, you you it's that it's more to do with that last 20 to 10 percent 
that you want to fine tune your image. So rather than trying to go back and forth and try and tweak your shader and try and tweak your light settings to like, like fine tune it hundred percent within render, you might go, well, actually, you know what? I can do some of this and I have more flexibility mm. to sculpt my image within comp. And it allows you to do that 10, 20% and have more control over it. In real time. In real time, time. yeah. Because it becomes right. real time when it's comped pretty much. So mm -hmm. it's the flexibility of that, like you say. And you start, you get a better understanding as well of how much light information actually exists within these files and, and stuff. Because 16 bit uh, EXRs, you were surprised how much information is in there. You can really fine tune the image. Nice. I get, I get why people do it directly uh in in the render and in the ipr or whatever especially octane has really nice tone mapping applied to it by default i get that uh and i totally understand but i think it's because after effects is just really terrible at working with this multi-pass avs as well and fusion is pretty good but still correct me if i'm wrong it was been a while since i used it but you can't split out one exr into multiple avs and then reassemble it you have to kind of have a loader for each, if I'm not AV. I know it's getting technical now, so. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but like, uh, I mean, in Nuke, it's just a very seamless experience. And it, it also allows you to be quite uh, in the same, it's the same reason why we like Houdini, because it's very modular. It's like you, you build a comp and you can kind of use that same framework for multiple shots later. And you can essentially a lot of the compositing you like you can develop compositing networks essentially for things that you might do at later dates mm -hmm. as well so you can dive into a project and you can just pull out what you need and then essentially paste it in and connect it up and you've done all of the stuff that you want so if you were to do the same same thing in say for instance after effects you might have multiple adjustment layers or you might have effects on different ones inside pre -coms. it just becomes a lot harder to track where you've done those things with this you just yeah, Copy it's that. And then if you have like, if you have a heavy render, you might notice that, yeah, most of my grain is coming from the refraction of this one object. So why should you like denoise the entire image? You can do it in comp quite quickly. So. That's the thing. Yeah, I think when you can denoise particular channels is a really big benefit. because On particular lights. Essentially, yeah, because you might, if you denoise the whole, the, the, a whole image, essentially, depending on how much grain you have, it will soften the image as a whole. Whereas if you say, for instance, only wanted to denoise the refraction part, say for instance, yes, you would soften that ever so slightly, but you would keep all the crispness of your speculars and your, and your diffuse. Oh, so the, the, the difference that makes is huge. And obviously that allows you to render at lower samples to then kick out your renders faster and then adapt, adjust it in a, in a more real-time comping environment. And then for changes, like we had a patch shot on the job recently, <laughs> which like it, it was dragging on and it was like, I could get rid of that reflection in that object and we're done with refraction there. It's like, good luck. You have to re-render that over and over again. Like it's going to take you two years. Whereas here we had like, we had 15 lights. <laughs> we have each light has its own refraction reflection. We have crypto mats for, to pull mats automatically from any object. We have puzzle mats to pull specific things through refraction. I mean, it's just, it, why would it, why would you say no to that flexibility? Sure. Yeah, it doesn't I, take long either, to be honest. It's quite fast. I th Liam, I, I think you're on the call here. I th correct me if I'm wrong, too. You just went through something where you broke out the, you had a bunch of grain in your shadows or something, and you just denoised that, and it, like, kicked out the render. He was able to render the project, like, 100 times faster or whatever, just because he... I, he not, not quite 100, but, yeah, I did something <laughs> like that where in Redshift to get my GI pass really clean. I, I was up to like 4096 plus for samples. Like it was just getting really up there and my render time was getting to like five minutes of frame or something. So I asked a buddy of mine if I could just run neat video or a denoiser on the GI pass. And I ended up just doing like a 64 sample GI pass and running it through neat video and it looked identical. Like. Yeah. And so I cut my render times in half. So yeah, I, I love doing stuff like that for comp. Yeah, and Redshift's uh, AOV system is pretty robust. We, uh, I see another question that we, if we use different renders, we, we mainly reuse Redshift. I don't, since I came here, at least we've only used Redshift. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, just monitoring the chat here. It looks like Pedro has a question and I think he's at work, so I don't think he can ask it live here, but he's asking about your positioning uh, for your studio and like, how do you want to position the studio in the mind of your clients and potential clients? Sure. I think the thing is, like, it's kind of what I was saying in the beginning, like uh, when you come up with a label for your studio, like your studio and the positioning, like, uh, we've gone with creative studio for the essentially we want to be considered as, at an earliest possible stage so we want to solve the great problems not just execute the, the methods to get them done so the, the stuff that sort of comes across that we need to like we want to be doing going forward is essentially creating uh content for clients that actually it connects with them rather than just shows off the, the, the niceties of a render and that's kind of where we want to be. It's, an, uh, as I said, it's an uphill battle because essentially you need to build a reputation to get to that point. And essentially everything that we do at the moment is to build Panoply's reputation. And it, that it, everything, like that is why we, we're particular about the types of jobs we choose. So the position that we is, is like it, it's the design, the creative end of things, but we are a full functioning studio and we can see things through. And there's a benefit of doing that. So rather than just coming to us and kind of us just going, okay, well, look, we could direct this and we could farm a lot of this out to sort of like a, a studio somewhere else in Europe, or say, for instance, uh, we could do that. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Um, but the benefit comes of when we do it in-house, the, the, the thinking remains on the table in like one place. Yeah. So the problems that we can solve, it allows a much more streamlined process and we convey that to our clients at that in, in that entity as well. Yeah, because a lot of concepts and a lot of ideas, they come from the fact that we understand the entire process of, of the production. If we were to just sketch something out and hand it to a production company, it wouldn't, we, couldn't, we wouldn't be able to stand, make sure that it has the quality that we, we're after. Because we, well, it need would be lot, out of you our need more time. Yeah, we need more yeah. time. So you need then more check-ins and more lessons. Unless you're sitting behind, they, uh, sitting, like visiting them or sort of going through it with them, it becomes... It's a totally different challenge and it's not the sort of operation that we're looking to build at the moment. We're looking to build a small, t like, like we're not looking to build a multi like, country studio. Essentially, we're looking to build a, a, a team, a, a really close knit, high skilled team that can essentially tack, tackle jobs in small teams within, like if we've got say eight people here, we might be able to run three huge jobs but we're able to do that with assistance from remote freelancers as well. And essentially the cooperation sort of works because everything is kept in house. And that is the benefit that we want to sort of put across to clients. And there is a benefit I think in doing that because essentially the longer the chain gets, and I know as a freelancer, I remember this, like often you might be going through, I don't know, four different chains of people to get to the person that's making that decision. Um, if you are creating, uh, like actually creating that sort of rung on that ladder, you have got to remember that essentially you're creating a bit of a problem as well. So do you want to be that point? Do you want to be that stopping point and then take advantage of it and then make sure everything is controlled within that entity and you run that team? Or do you kind of want to go, well, look, we'll take responsibility for this, but then we need to sort of bring these other guys in and then this creates another barrier for the things because then you take responsibility for that barrier. And it's, it's, it's just a choice when you like with, with what type of company you want to build. And it's just, that's not kind of what we're setting out to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess kind of in a certain vein with that, uh, Jeff, I don't know if you've got a mic and want to ask that question that you just dropped in the chat. Um, let's see, You're, it automatically mutes you. There you go. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I can ask the question. It's pretty straightforward. I'm just curious to know, uh, because you, um, maybe you said this at the beginning, and maybe I missed it, but uh, you are, you said you could, you could, at this moment, sort of scale up to about eight people. Did you say how many you are at the moment? Well, literally, at the moment, we're just two to four, uh, two or three of us in his studio. Um, the thing is, but we have, we scale up on a per project basis. Right. So, um, that, so that was really my question was like, how, you know, given your size, like how many projects are you typically working on at a given time? Like, 
We can run a, like we, at times we've run three projects, I think, at the same time. Yeah. Like that would be when we've got everyone in here. Um, so, so it's a case of, and that also might include people working remotely as well. Um, it's just a case of uh, like we, we have been rather picky with jobs and there has been a lot of times when we could have taken a lot of production style jobs, essentially where the, cl the creative's done, design's almost done. They've given us a script and they kind of go, look, we don't know how to do this. Can you do this? And then for those jobs, we always say no, purely, but not because uh, we can't do it, purely because we see no benefit in doing those types of one. One, you'll burn out the staff and the team because we set ourselves to do a design creative end of things. If you're not doing that, well, one, the client's not getting the benefit of our skill set. And two, it was yeah. the... you're telling the wrong story. Yeah, basically. exactly. Yeah. We, we could actually stretch up to more than eight in here too, if we wanted, really wanted to. But so far, we haven't had to. We're enjoying that. Yeah, we've just moved into this space <laughs> in the this summer. Space. So it's we, scaled case. Up, we scaled up to like double the size yeah. of what we have. But it sounds like you were, you know, you get a project and you focus, you really sort of focus on, on building that project. Um, and, you know, obviously, if you get larger then you have to feed more people and that means you have to bring more work in and then you have to start um i guess filtering more in terms of how you oversee projects right As, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah i think it's the case that's where i was sort of saying about your reputation as a studio so like if you can build a strong reputation for the type of work you want to do and you continue to output that if you're selective on the beginning and then that's where they, if you build your reputation on those ones you should get your momentum, it, or we've been getting our momentum from that, to essentially just make sure that when we do grow our team more, like we're, when we do bring more people in house, we've got plans to in the near, very near future to bring more people in full time, but we're being very selective about the types of roles that we bring people in for. Um, but the people that we want to bring in, they're going to come to expect a certain type of project that we will be trying to focus on because of one, the size of what we are like it's a case of we're not bringing in projects where we've got a team of 20 people so we just actually have like you said feed like put food on the table so yeah. we're trying it, it, it it's a fine line basically uh but it's everything comes down to that reputation if we've seen from our own experience putting in that time to maintain that reputation and not trying letting that slip that has allowed us to get the projects we want to do and also sort of build that reputation up as well. Yep. <laughs> Some of that. <laughs> uh, Matthew had a question about onboarding and I'm just trying to clarify within the chat um, if he's referencing um, or referring to onboarding freelancers. Oh, yeah. So he's wondering about how you guys onboard artists when they come on to jobs. As in like whether they're working remotely or we mean like as in like in-house. So it's just a term onboarding. I'm not 100%, I'm not a term that I've heard actually. Being like on board? Reference on board. Um, testing. Yeah, see, I probably just how you catch them up or get them up to speed. Oh, like, you mean as in how do you just sort of like bring them, oh, incorporate them. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah like it's because of, uh, that's the easiest way it's like the london design community like the motion design community is so close close knit and a lot of the people that we work with are people that we know um like that we've worked with in the past whether that's been from the man value days or actually as panoply we brought people in as well so it's a case of they kind of know how we work as like as a team or how we want to work going forward so that's not necessarily been a problem the time zone when we brought in people say for remote people it's a case of everything is essentially run through like everything's run on dropbox we have a producer that runs and liaises with them but it's a case of they very much from a remote um, possibility it's more been that people are brought in on those ones for specific roles so we might have something that has to be remodeled or something like that and that's not because we don't trust the people to do uh, uh, anything else outside of that outside of the studio it's more just been a case of for ease of use and ease of sort of like getting sort of where the project's going because if we're doing a really tight turnaround project it can be very hard to work with a remote freelancer on that basis purely because different time zones can cause issues and it's more about having that efficiency when you're working on a tight deadline um it's 
the short answer is we've worked with a lot of people we uh, we know and we have we we're used to working with so then they say they know how we want to work we have a whole system that's set up essentially that br briefs new people when they come in it's essentially you get used to it like you read like a one-page uh, internal thing we have here that essentially briefs you on your uh, on our file structure how, how it works work and this comes back to when we have a much simpler software setup there's not much to sort of convey it's kind of like look this is what this is this is what that is this is what we expect and uh, you people get up and running quite quickly nice. i think does that kind of answer what you're after I don't, yes I mean, we, we do have kind of a trial period if there's new people we're working with we try we try to book them for a shorter period of time and, and test them and, and see if they're they what kind of role i mean that, everyone does that yeah. right? they work with people they don't know to test them we don't just take the word for it they can do stuff because it's tricky. <laughs> the, the water can be muddy if yes on, on yeah i think you guys <laughs> nailed what uh what matthew was asking because he he kind of clarified a little bit later that he knows another uh single provider type agency that they have like a one sheet that they can essentially mm -hmm. go through and, and get caught up to speed and i know like brett with ranger and fox they've got like a little binder that they give freelancers to onboard them with the file structures and you know all that's just to, to keep everything working smooth so um i'll say this I, I put it into the chat but uh last call for questions where we've passed the hour mark so we'll start wrapping up here um but if anyone has any additional questions feel free to hop in real quick now um or pop your question into the chat um let's see i'm gonna just scan the chat one more time to make sure i didn't leave anything on the table here uh cool um all right well i just want to say a big thank you to mark and simon for taking time out of your busy schedule as i'm sure you guys have uh just spend some time with us and kind of you know talk about the studio and the game awards spot um really appreciate it so thank you very much um if for those people listening or if people aren't familiar with you guys, where can they find you online? It's uh, panoply.co.uk. And uh, yes, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> like all the socials. Yeah, the social stuff, everything's like uh, all our social handles are Panoply Creative. So you'll find us on Twitter, Instagram. Like we often get told off for not being very forward on social. So uh, it's more the case of like, there's, there's, there's only so many hours in the day and um, yeah, like it's a case of we'll post as much as we can do and we'll share more usually when we have a little bit of a breather. Uh, we don't, sadly, we don't get as many as we'd like, but I think it's a case of that's usually where it is. At. Yeah. But, so, um, be, uh, thanks for having us on and yeah. yeah, it's been really great to sort of answer any of you guys' questions. Awesome. Well, thank you guys very much. Uh, again, we very much appreciate it and you guys have a happy holiday. Um, and hopefully you can get a little bit of a break during this time <laughs> between projects. But uh, with that being said, I've got a couple of links that I was just going to share with uh, everyone on the call. Just kind of a kind of a wrap up here of what might have happened over the last week. Obviously, uh, the new Mac Pro is now out in the wild. So I've got a couple of links uh, from that that I'll drop in. Uh, there is a a photographer, videographer dude uh, that I'm sure some of you are familiar with. His name is Vincent Lafore. He's been on Max, uh, on the Mac Pro for quite a while now. Um, and he wrote up a bit of a review on his time working with it. And within that too, he also has a um, kind of different builds of the Mac Pro um different configurations and price points and stuff for different types of creatives so if you're uh if you're interested in dropping a lot of money on a pretty looking machine <laughs> that might force you into updates who knows <laughs> uh check out that but some interesting resources because obviously there's been a lot of chat online about you know the price points for things there the 1.5 terabytes of RAM uh, and, and all that good stuff. Um, and then 
let's see. Sakani just put out an awesome piece, uh, like a little fan piece uh, called Star Wars The Last Stand, which uh, looks like he's been chipping away at for the last year or so, um, but just released a couple days ago. Some phenomenal work there. Um, and uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's been making its rounds. Definitely check it out. Um, let's see. Joe Donaldson is stepping down from motionographer. He's been uh, a guy on that site for, man, I, I think over 10 years or so. But he has a little farewell uh, post that he wrote up. Um, and Liam also just shared uh, in, the, uh, in the chat Grayscale Gorilla's thoughts on the new Mac. Um, so check that out. Um, and then some kind of unfortunate news in a way is that the MPC uh, Vancouver offices are closing after they finished up Lion King and all this, uh, um, you know, some big blockbuster hits. Unfortunately, that's closing down and there, it seems like they're shifting people away, but we know, all kind of know how that stuff goes, unfortunately, um, but Anyway, there's some good info out there about that. Um, there's also this spreadsheet that was shared on Reddit that kind of has a lot of interesting info about uh, rates and experience and whatnot that um, someone, I believe from MPC um, Vancouver created and like put together in this document. Anyway, uh, just drop the link in there. It's kind of interesting to look through and see the different rates and wages and experience levels and stuff like that. So uh, pretty interesting. And then uh, shout out the guys over at Yeti have dropped a style frames course uh, for motion designers. Um, and I'm linking to their Patreon page right now, um, but they uh, have been putting out some really cool stuff on their Patreon. So if you haven't uh, heard of them or seen any of their stuff, definitely check it out. They're mainly focused on Cinema 4D with uh, Octane and a little bit of Turbulence FD, RealFlow, X Particles. So uh, check them out if you haven't already. But um, Let's see, I think we will have a meeting next week. Liam, I don't know, are you, are you here still? Yeah, um, I should be. When... Maybe we'll do kind of a wrap up of the year. Uh, last January, we had a call, a, a meeting where we all kind of set goals for this year and maybe we could do kind of a goal wrap up type uh, meeting just to see if people hit their goals, keep people accountable. I know I came close to some of them. I didn't accomplish them all, but uh, it'd be fun to kind of have a little uh, follow up to that. So um, maybe, maybe we can go s on a topic like that, Liam, I don't know, but stay tuned to all of our social channels and the Slack channels and whatnot uh, for more of an update on that. But um Again, thanks to Mark and Simon for joining us today. Um, really appreciate it. And until next week, everyone have a great week. Kick butt. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Bye. Mm -hmm.